We've got a great topic. Uh, we're going to be grappling with some tough questions, but I, I just want at the beginning to, to just think about what realistically we can cover. You know, this topic of identity um, has lots of related issues, doesn't it? You know, trans, sexual identity, as well as issues of worth and significance and self-definition and all of that. And these are huge topics. Each one of those could take easily three talk so we're going to be trying we're going to be much more foundational uh in these three sessions laying some of the foundations some of the ways of thinking and ways of looking at these issues rather than going into them in any great detail directly uh, but we are having a q a session that ben's going to anchor tomorrow night uh and we'll um that'll be a chance for you to you know bring up lots of kind of hot button issues. Can I say also, I, I'm always conscious of meetings like this. There are lot, everyone has a story. We all have backgrounds. We're all bringing baggage in a way to um, a meeting like this. And, uh, you know, if I say something that, that you find hard to hear, I, I want to say, um, I, I often say to people who are learning to be a, to, to preach and speak. You'll never keep everybody happy because some people, just the way you do that with your fingers is going to remind them of their father and the way he used to do that. And you've got no control over that. So I, I just want to say, you know, when we're talking about some of these very personal issues, it can be easy to be misheard. So I, I just want to apologize in advance. But if there's something I talk about that's an issue that you'd like to talk about uh, specific to what I've said, then do come and unpick it, you know, rather than let it grumble away in the back of your mind. Did he really say that? I can't believe that he really thinks that. You know, come and get that clarification. If it's a bit more personal, if it's to do with your, your own kind of emotional, personal walk, there's a fantastic pastoral team here. I know many of you have already signed up to talk to someone. It's, it's the boldest thing you can do in life if you're struggling with an issue, is to talk to somebody about it. It's a wonderful thing. And of course, part of our, the beauty of being part of the church and of God's people is being a part of a flock. And there are people who, for different times in our lives, will shepherd us and pastor us, give us some space to talk through some of our issues so you know if there's something on your heart do do go and see one of the the pastoral team because i know they're hungry to help and can offer something beyond this weekend in terms of ongoing contact as well okay so i'm going to be thinking about some tricky and challenging issues aren't we um, but rather than this being about my ideas about identity this weekend and maybe some of your ideas, we want all our thinking, don't we, to be shaped by God's mind in these areas as it's been revealed to us in his word. So in all three talks, we're going to anchor our thinking in the passage we just read together. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, through to chapter 3 verse 3 and that is going to be the focus especially for this evening we're going to do a deep dive into this passage and use it as the foundation for the next two sessions that follow okay so the section we read together from 1 john 3 it sits in the wider context doesn't it of john's first epistle and uh of course, we need to think about the people he was writing to, the kind of person John was, and the issues he was dealing with in their lives at the time. Um, and then in the light of that, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to see how John's words written for them have meaning and significance for our lives here today. So who was John, first of all? Well, it seems very probable that, that the writer of this epistle is the same John who authored the fourth gospel. Scholars tell us there are many parallels of thought between his letters here and that 
gospel. And we know through uh, um, Polycarp, one of his disciples who influenced somebody called Irenaeus, that uh, he lived to a great age, John, and spent most of his later life in Ephesus, from which this letter is most likely written. And this first letter appears to have been a pastoral circular sent out to congregations under his care, scattered across Asia Minor, which is uh, most of what we now call Turkey. And from various themes that arise, we have a fairly good idea about some of the issues people were, were struggling with in those days. How similar were they, I wonder, to some of ours? Well, they lived in a pagan, secular society. John knew that, deeply at odds with what the Christian faith stood for, what their faith stood for. John himself would regularly have walked down the streets of his hometown of Ephesus with its huge religious industry centered around the goddess Diana. Great is Diana of the Ephesians, if you remember from Acts. And the magnificent wealth and splendor of that pagan culture. As he walked the streets, the atmosphere would have been alive with so-called sacred prostitution and sorcery and magic and mystery. So, well, was it a kind of debauched, amoral culture then we're looking at here? Is that what I'm describing? Well, far from it, actually. There were very clear moral standards set within framework of Greek or Roman culture at the time in Ephesus, in these places. Courage, loyalty, these were moral imperatives. They were prized, you see, and especially loyalty to your family and your family's ancestral gods. It mattered that you followed in the traditions of your family. Every home had its own altar for honoring your ancestors. And it was your moral duty to honor them. Here's a surprise, though. Marriage was monogamous in Roman culture, and adultery was frowned on. So you say, hey, uh, so what's the difference? That's kind of on our page now, aren't we? Well, <laughs> here's the difference. It was frowned on only if the person involved was of the same social standing. As a man, though, you could have sex, married or not, with anybody you liked, male, female, child, provided they were of a lower social standing to you. It was immoral to have sex outside of your marriage with someone of equivalence, but it provided they're lower. You, you get out there and have sex with anybody you like. That's fine. The moral code of the time, you see, was all to do with observing a, an appropriate social hierarchy. So they knew about right and wrong, but it was a very different right and wrong from our moral code today. And indeed, it was a code profoundly at odds with this fledgling new Christian faith scattered across these churches throughout Turkey. A faith, a faith, which was teaching the idea that every human being equally, from the bottom of the heap to the top, bore the image of God and mattered to him. And every human being equally from the bottom of the heap to the top, female and male, Greek or Jew, in or out, top of the social hierarchy or bottom, child or adult, every human being bore the dignity and worth of being created in the image of God. That sex is God's exclusive gift for the covenant of marriage, that the body created by God matters. There's something sacred about our bodies that divorce is wrong 
that unfaithfulness is a crime in the eyes of God. And that there's a natural moral shape to the world, to nature itself, as God created it. And we ignore it at our peril. Now, this revolutionary faith, you see, it posed us a real challenge to this existing uh, moral framework, especially to the, dominant, the dominance of men, and they didn't like it. The Roman historian Tacitus spoke of uh, early Christians as notoriously depraved, he said, these people, immoral people, you see. Later, he accused them of being hate-filled, hate-filled. That rings a bell for some of us, hate-filled. And of course, just a few years before these pages were written, the Emperor Nero had lit up his garden parties with the burning carcasses of Christian human torches. So these people knew what it was to stand against the flow of culture. So life was tough for them on the outside. The problems inside the church, though, as well, and John is addressing those in his letters here, the growing infiltration of false teaching called Gnosticism, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M, derived from the Greek word gnosis, knowing, or knowledge. And in fact, Gnosticism was become one of the greatest heresies with which the Christian faith was going to have to contend for the next three centuries. So what was Gnosticism? This lower world Gnosticism taught has effectively been created by incompetent or evil gods. And second, you need to get out of this everyday world of matter and bodies, reality, into a higher spiritual plane, or rather a deeper spiritual mystery that lies buried in the self. And third, the escape hatch from this world to that is noses, knowing the secrets hidden inside the self. We all like to be on secrets. So in the Gnostic worldview, the material world, it's just an ugly outcrop of the misshapen handiwork of its evil creators. And as a result, all of the so-called, you know, natural distinctions, um, male and female, or the notion of there being a right order to human sexuality are at best illusions, it taught, and at worst corrupted deceits. Your salvation is out of all of that, looking within, for the wisdom that comes from a deep dive into your inner soul and the secrets you find there. 2,000 years old, folks. Sounds surprisingly contemporary, doesn't it? Tom Wright, the theologian, calls Gnosticism the great myth of our modern age. Well, inside yourself, you know? Be your own inner hero. Hey, look, you just need to be you. Just, just look inside and, and let, it, let it free. Don't you tell me who I am or what reality is. I decide. Don't you tell me um, what my identity is. I get to say what my identity is. And if reality doesn't line up with what I say about my identity, it's reality that changes, not me. I identify as. It's the claim to the sovereignty, the self, over the material world. And it's everywhere on our streets today. So, bearing all of this in mind, going back to John's time, John is writing a letter designed to buttress and stabilize the faith of people with 
at odds with their culture on the inside and struggling with attractive but false new teaching, sorry, on the outside, but struggling with attractive but false new teaching on the inside. It's got growing relevance for us, really, when you think about it, hasn't it? So John's message begins appropriately. Dear children, continue in him. Verse 28, now, dear children, do you see it if you've got your Bibles open there? Continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Stay with and in Christ. Live deeply in him. Keep your anchor in him. So that when he comes, there's no cause for red-faced guilt or lame excuses that he's just wanted to fit in with the crowd. And he goes on, if you know that he is righteous, verse 29, you, you know that everyone who does what is right continues in him. That's the flow of it, isn't it? You know, continue in him, he says. And then verse 29, if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does right has been continuing in him or continues in him. Except he doesn't say that, does he? Did you notice? He surprises us in verse 28 by interjecting a whole new theme. And the theme is that everybody who does right has been born of God. And listen, everybody, this is the theme that will become one of the dominant themes of this letter. Because John believes this is the truth that will give the readers, his readers, the confidence and the grit for the kind of perseverance he's calling for here. Children of God. And so what is happening here in verse 29 is that John moves from his first point, the call to remain in him, to his second point, which is the provision that makes that possible. And that provision is that we've been born of God. Born. The Greek word is begotten. God has sired a people for himself. Now look where John takes us, verse 1, chapter 3. John, the idea of being a child of God seems, seems to launch John in, into, a, in, 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 into a, a great hymn of praise. He gets quite emotional at this point. You'd see verse 1, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. It's quite emotional. Um, that little word see, for instance, uh, it's a pity we have it translated see doesn't really do justice, the original Greek. You know, C kind of it reads like a leisurely invitation to maybe look up when you finish checking your emails in your own time. C, you know, look at this. But the original Greek John uses here is a word that conveys urgency. It demands our attention. The, um, the King James Version kind of captures it better with behold, you see, behold. Um, it's, a, it's a taking us by the shoulders word, an aorist imperative in, in the Greek, shaking us. Guys, are you with me here, he's saying. That's the word, the tone of that word is explosive. He needs our attention because this is important. We are the children of God. And, and it doesn't stop there, actually, because uh, we read on, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. What great love. The word great love can also be translated 
and better translated, what kind of love, what measure of love. In fact, quite literally, I understand the Greek there should be translated, of what country is this love? See, he's saying, of what country is this love? This love so foreign to our thinking, he's saying, it's a love from another realm, another universe, another place. Of course, so it is. And he's not stopping there with his sense of urgency and emotional excitement about this. It's a love which has been lavished on us. You see, he's reaching for the words, drenching cascading down like a waterfall on us that we should be called children of God. Because that is who we are. That is our identity. And that is why John is so energized. You know, friends, in today's culture of entitlement, people don't, they don't find it particularly startling to discover that God should love them like, like John does here. Of course, if there's a God, you know, he'd love me. I mean, it's the only kind of God I'd be prepared to believe in. You know, I've asked a few Christians about this. You might ask yourself, I said, honestly, do you find it hard to believe that God loves you? And quite a few have said, if I'm honest, no. I find it hard to believe he loves him <laughs> and her. You know, I mean, that is that does open my heart to see the love of God. But no, me, if I'm honest, I, 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 and and we're immersed in a culture in which the highest good is to love yourself, and so it comes almost naturally to us, you see, that God would love us. He would want to get in on the act as well. Hey, Jesus, welcome aboard. If we want to grasp the cause of the apostles' energy and excitement unleashed in chapter 3, verse 1, you need to bear in mind that John is speaking as a Jewish man here, schooled in Jewish history and tradition and Jewish insights about the nature of the God they worshipped with a profound sense of his holiness and his otherness and his glory. John, he had been raised on stories such as Moses and the burning bush. He'd heard how many centuries before, after years of exile from the Egyptian courts in which he'd been raised, a young Hebrew, or by now an older Hebrew man called Moses, looking after some sheep. That's where he's ended up, from the courts of Egypt to looking after his father Jethro's sheep on the side of Mount Sinai. Suddenly, so when the story had seen a strange sight of a bush with the appearance of being on fire, but not being consumed. He, he decides to take a closer look. But as he approaches, he, he hears a voice calling to him from inside the bush. Do not come any closer. Moses, take off your sandals for the place you're standing on is holy ground. Sandals. And the culture of the time. Sandals were kind of a symbol of your independence. You know, you decided to do something, you put on your sandals and you went and you did it. Well, this isn't the order of things here. This voice is saying, this isn't about your plans, Moses, your ideas, who you are. Take off your sandals. You stand on holy ground. This is the place of God. And Moses asked God for, the, for his name, the name of the divine power who is addressing him, which is a perfectly reasonable question, you'd think. He wanted to know God's identity. 
you know, where God fitted into the, into the scheme of things. Perfectly reasonable. He knew there were many gods, the God of this place, the God of that place, and the God of this mountain and that mountain. And he wanted to know who this God was. What was his name? And you see, if I find out your name, um, I can find out a lot about you, can't I? I can work out where you fit in quite quickly. I can Google you. I can research your background. I can look you up. I can work out where you came from and make a pretty good stab at where you're going. I'm a psychiatrist, after all. But, um, and so it's natural enough for Moses to ask when he learns that God is sending him to liberate a, a, an enslaved people. It's perfectly reasonable to say, well, who shall I tell them sent me? Where do you fit into the scheme of things? And do you remember the words that he heard in reply? Air Asher Aye. Air Asher Aye was the words. I am who I am. I don't fit in anywhere in your reality. Friends, you see, everything we understand in the world around us has a beginning have an end. Everything. Think of a wisp of a, a cloud that suddenly appears out of nowhere and it disappears. Think of a plant growing up out of the soil, blossoming, and then it dies back into the soil from which it returns and the elements are scattered. Think of you and me driven into being in the mystery of, of our genetic profile and epigenetic energies and then one day as sure as night follows day falling back into the dust from which we came beginning and end we fitted in for a short while and then we went away and that's why we need to have a name where we can be placed the scheme to which we belong but friends god cannot be understood in that way, he doesn't come into being and pass away. He is. That is what Moses is being told here. I am who I am. You will never contain me in the limits of your understanding. If you understand, said St. Augustine, that isn't God. Because you will never get God clear in your understanding as a creature of his. He doesn't fit into the universe. The universe, he lies beneath the universe. The universe exists at his pleasure and by his word. He is outside of time and space without beginning, without end. I am who I am. And now, now, maybe we're ready to... To, to see why John the Apostle, John the Hebrew, schooled in these ancient stories is so animated, so insistent on our attention, that this great mystery should make himself known, the person of his son, Jesus Christ, and live incarnate among us. That's wonder enough. But now that he should stoop to love us, to desire us, to father us. Behold. So as we draw our session to a, a close, what, what kind of children are we? This is what we are, John says, the End of verse, middle of verse one. Well, what are we as children of God? Well, it's not adoption that's in view here. There's a powerful strand of teaching in scripture that we are adopted children of God. Orphans out in the rain, nobody who cares about us. And we've all got a sense of being orphaned, haven't we? I have at times. 
orphaned, out in the rain. We've been brought in, adopted, male or female, into all of the privileges and legal standing of a firstborn son. You're mine. And it's wonderful, but as wonderful as that is, that is not the kind of sonship that is in view here in these verses. What is in view is akin more to a natural childbirth. As I said a few minutes ago, where John says, end of verse 29, we've been born of him. The word there is begotten of him. It means to have been sired by God. Look ahead to verse 9 of chapter 3. What do you see there? No one who is born of God will continue in sin because God's seed remains in him. Now there's mystery here. Of course there is. But can it be laid out any more graphically by John? And in some mysterious sense, we're not just declared children of God. We're not simply considered to be children of God or legally reconstituted children of God. We are children of God. It's not something we identify as Christian believers. It is something that we are. It is something that identifies us. And it's something that we have been made. Now it goes to the very nature of our being. Children. God. And there is nothing good in the universe that he wouldn't plunder for your good. Because you're his child. He loves you very much. Now look, I just want to be careful here because of of course, John is not saying that we've been made divine in the sense of having in any way the nature of the eternally begotten Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the incarnate Son of God, Jesus. He is the Word made flesh. And, and in fact, John uses a different Greek word in this epistle to describe Christ himself in chapter 4, verse 9. And uh, if you flip over to that, chapter 4, verse 9, you'll see he, he says, so goodbye. he sent, God sent his one and only son, you see, not his, just his, his, his begotten son, his, uh, his one and only son. And he uses that term to distinguish the nature of Jesus' eternal begottenness from our begottenness. He is the one and only only begotten son of God. And John is very careful to draw that distinction. Nevertheless, there is a sense in which by virtue of the work of Christ and our being incorporated into him, God has bestowed on us something of his own beauty and glory. As Peter puts it, we are partakers of the divine nature. Partakers, born of God. This, John believes, is the truth that will buttress the faith of these believers against the onslaught of persecution from without and false teachers from within. This is what will help them swim against the tide and be wholly distinctive because they are distinctive. They are different. This is what you are. That is the weight of his message here. And so for us, everybody, our identity is not something we go looking for inside or that we assert or self-construct our self-understanding. And we all have to build a self-understanding. I'll talk a little bit more about this in the morning. But our self-understanding, our concept, doesn't start with who we are. That isn't our preoccupation initially. It starts with 
what we are. Humans with a created nature, a bodily nature, and children of God with a spiritual nature. And all of us, if we look to our lives ahead, well, as you look to your life ahead, will flourish as we learn to live in harmony with what we truly are. And we will hit hard times when we stop or fail to do that. 